Welcome to our third in-person service. So good to see you all masked and well spaced. And I'm sure many of you will have noticed how much better our church facilities look with all the cleaning and the organizing organizing that's been done by Diane and the trustees, Linda Thompson and Ray Newman and many others. And our heartfelt thanks go out to all of them. And also welcome to those who are tuned in via Zoom. A happy 4th of July to you all. I'm delighted that you could all join us in extending a very warm welcome to our new pastor. Pastor Reverend <laughs> And after the service, please join us for a, in Johnson Hall for a celebratory reception. And now, the choir will bless us with invitation.
I'm Flora Marlins, Chair of the Staff Parish Relations Committee. And it is my joy and honor to introduce you to Reverend Kara Sprouts, a new pastor. Reverend Kara Sprouts has been the pastor at Glenmont United Methodist Church since 2018. She served as the associate pastor at Bethesda UMC for five years before coming to Glenmont. She grew up in Washington, D.C. and attended the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she majored in math and English. While <laughs> teaching math in Cape Town, South, Af South Africa, Reverend Kara felt called to build and bridge communities of faith and she came home ready to pursue ordination in the United Methodist Church. She earned her Master's in Divinity from Yale Divinity School, where she most enjoyed studying environmental theologies, global sacred music, and pastoral care with refugee populations. Reverend Kara is a competitive runner and triathlete who also enjoys cooking, board games, and gardening. She lives in a lively and love-filled home in Kensington, Maryland, with two Montessori teachers and their three-year-old, who you will likely see running through the Zoom screen enduring meetings. She recently bought her first car, but prefers to get most places by bicycle. So she's already scoped out the best routes to church from Kensington. SPRC asks your patience as Reverend Karen learns the names of their a big thanks to Mary Lou Griffin in the Chair of Membership and Evangelism, Christine Lee, Office Manager, and Linda Thompson, Minister of Visitation, for their work preparing a journal to help Reverend Carol put names and buyers with faces. And thanks to each member of the <laughs> congregation who submitted a brief bio for the journal. Now, I'm going to ask Gordon Craig and Reverend Joy Jones to join me in the welcoming of Reverend Karen Scroggins. Your responses will be shown on the screen. Dear friends, today we welcome Reverend Kara Sproggins, who has been appointed to serve as our pastor. We believe that she is well qualified and has been prayerfully appointed by our bishop, Bishop Latrell Easterly. Reverend Kara, you have been sent to live among us as a bearer of the word of God, a minister of the sacraments, and, wow. and a sustainer of the love, order, service, and discipleship of the people of God. Today, I reaffirm this commitment in the presence of this congregation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as a people committed to participate in the ministries of the church, by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service, will you, who celebrate 
this new beginning, support and uphold Reverend Kara in these ministries. How beautiful on the mountain are the feet of the messenger. Let us pray. Eternal God, richly bless your servant, Reverend Kara Scroggins, and her entrance into our fellowship this day. Fill her with the power of your Holy Spirit, and let her find with us an open door for the Word. Strengthen and sustain her and us in our ministries together with Reverend Kara as our pastor. Give her and us patience, courage, and wisdom to care for one another and challenge one another so that together we may follow Jesus Christ, living together in love and offering our gifts and talents in your service. Amazing God, you do call us into your service and send us to spread the message of the salvation of your Son. Equip us with a spirit of willingness that we can with courage be witnesses of your love through the words of our mouths and our ways of living. Grant us all to partake of your strength and joy so that we can enter into the anxiety and suffering of the world radiating your love and making alive the hope which Christ gave us. All of this we dare to pray to you, for you are to us the Father of mercy, the God of all grace. You are the Son, the Savior, and the Redeemer. You are the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Helper, the Giver of life. Blessed be Reverend Kara, accept this Bible and be among us as one who proclaims the word. Amen. Reverend Kara, accept this water and baptize the Christians in this place. Amen. Reverend, take this cup, take this plate, and keep us in communion with Christ and his church. Amen. Amen. Reverend Kara. Use this hymnal and book of worship to guide us in our prayer and praise. Amen. Reverend Carroll, receive this book of discipline and help us to keep the covenant and straighten our connections. Amen. I want to hold this for all of you can see this. There's a card outline from the continent of Africa. Reverend Kara, receive the symbol of the church's global and lead us in our mission to community and all the world. Amen.
I invite you to pray with me the prayer that will be on the screen. Let's pray together. Lord God, bless the ministries of your church. We thank you for the gifts, the gifts you have bestowed upon us. Draw us together in one spirit, that each of us may use our differing gifts as members of one body. May your word be proclaimed with faithfulness, and may we be doers of your word. As we I'm going to kneel and ask um, to pray with me. And I will be praying this blessing on you as well. Let us pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord the just come and you and give you peace. Amen. We will sing our next hymn, which is This is the Day of New Beginnings, and we'll be singing the first four verses. Thank you, Laura and Gordon. Enjoy. <laughs> Let's sing as we sing. service that I call the word for all ages, recognizing that they are our children who might be worshiping with us via Zoom, and even if they're not in the room with us, they are in our worship space with us always, and that we carry our own child inside of us that is ready to learn and to, um, to hear stories. And so I have brought with me a backpack that is pretty big. It's a pretty good backpack, and it's, it's a good backpack for going to new places. And so I brought some options of items to put in this backpack, and I was wondering, um, I'm going to be asking for some, some active words, participation as we try this. So I have, I, first I have some, some big options. I've got this brick. I always like to travel with the brick, my trusty brick, and this brick um, it's kind of broken and craggy, and it, it reminds me of all the times that I've messed up, that I like, I, I did this thing wrong, I stood up at the wrong time, I um, didn't do a very 
meaningful prayer and worship. So let me just stick that in this big old bag here. Um, I got a weight, calling this the weight of expectations of what I expect this new place to be like and all the things that I'm just expecting to find there. Um, and so I'm just going to bring that. And then the last giant item that I love to carry, maybe I'll just throw this on my back, is this book, this lovely binder, where I have written. It's full of handwritten notes every time someone has done something to make me mad or annoyed or just irritated i've written it down so i can carry it with me wherever i go and you know what I'm, I'm just i don't even want it to get in my backpack so i'm just going to hold it in my hand so i can read it as i go and keep remembering all those times so this is not the most efficient way to travel right my bag is heavy I uh, might hurt my back, and if someone wants to shake my hand or give me a hug or even offer me a snack, which I love snacks, um, I can't take it because my hands are full and I'm carrying all this stuff around. The scripture lesson that Gordon is going to read for us is Jesus' instructions for going on a journey, and he talks about paying attention to what you bring with you whenever you go to a new space, and I'm quite obviously coming to a new space right now, but we're all coming to a new space together because this is a way of worshiping that you and I have never done. Um, this is a way of coming back into a sanctuary that you all are new to relatively, and I'm very new to. And so I brought some reminders for myself of other things I might put in my backpack. Oh, I can't even hear this. <laughs> I'm wondering, um, I'm going to give us three examples, and maybe you can, you can come up with some others. Here they go. Well, I lost them already. Oh, no, they're here. So I brought uh, some tissues to remind me about soft words, gentle words. These are nice and light. These won't weigh me down. I brought this sweet, too expensive inflatable pillow that I got from REI, um, but it takes your breath. To, to fill it up and to blow it up. And so um, instead of all of those expectations, bringing um, deep breaths, the time and the space to take a breath and to breathe. And then I brought a bendy cara to remind me to bring my flexibility. When I go to a new place to bring flexibility and deep breath and gentle, soft words. Anything else you could think of that you might bring to a new place? Fire. Open heart. A compass. I saw a beautiful one out there. Open mind. Water. Nourishment. Openness and lightness. And so I'm going to invite you to pray with me as we bless and ask God to bless our journey. Let's pray. Loving God, help us to pay attention to take stock of what we are carrying with us in our hearts and on our backs and in our arms and on our schedules. We take a minute to take a deep breath and to offer to you what we don't need for the next step of the journey. Help us to go forward in trust, carrying with us open hearts, soft words, water, and enough to offer for others. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Thanks for playing with me. I think the choir has a anthem for us.
we have a time now for prayers of the people, and I know that um, different different congregations have different practices around prayers of the people. And sometimes maybe you take time and share joys and concerns, um, or sometimes maybe you've written them down. I saw some up here from March of 2020. Um, so I know that that's something that you do in this little time capsule. Um, and maybe sometimes one of you might come up and offer a prayer, but if, if there's something that's on your heart that you have been just waiting to come into a sanctuary with your fellow congregation to share. If you want to say that, I will repeat it back into my microphone so that our folks with us on Zoom can hear. Does anybody have something? It's okay if not to. Yes. celebration and can you tell me your names? Oh, it's Natalie. I heard about Natalie. <laughs> great things. All great things. Congratulations. And Natalie, for Natalie and Natalie's husband. Congratulations. 40 years. Anybody else have a joy or a concern? I see that Jesse's here with a microphone and pen always on it. We've got I'm Arda's husband, <laughs> and my prayer is that we will soon see the children back in the sanctuary with us. Amen. My name is Diane Walsh Barbalisi, and I have a concern this week. Um, I lost an uncle, and uh, my my other uncle, his brother, was just diagnosed with stage three cancer, and his wife this week is being uh, diagnosed with dementia. So I would just like a, a big church family prayer for my family if you don't mind. And a tough week. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. And I'm Jim's wife. Uh, <laughs> Um, some of you are aware of my brother who is 91 and just survived and was cancer-free prostate cancer, fell and broke his hip. He had surgery yesterday. As far as we know, the surgery went well. He's got a tough back. So I will continue to ask for prayers for Ferdinand Rudolph Hassel. Thank you. Hi. And I'd just like to uh, pray for uh, the people in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, now that we're leaving the country, uh, especially the translators, and the women, and the children, and all the vulnerable people, uh, just pray for the future. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm Joy Jones. I think you know who I am. Uh, I've known her for. Um, I received word on, on uh, oh boy, Friday that one of my oldest friends whom I've known since 77 has highly metastatic, highly malignant cancer. They're the same age and she has a very poor prognosis. Uh, her name is Claire. And you know, when it's your own age, a long time friend just reminds me for you. Good morning. I'm Elmira Williams. I certainly would like for us to keep in our hearts and our minds and send up special prayers for the unfortunate situation that happened in Florida several oh, a couple of weeks ago and for the loss of all of the lives. Thank you. Good morning, Reverend Kara and Jack Andrews. I wanted to 
express Sue's and my thanks to all of our church family for their good wishes on our 61st wedding anniversary this past week. And to uh, let you know that I'll be celebrating my 91st this week. July, and if you remember the uh, words of equality and liberty that our country was founded on, let us pray for our country to continue its journey on equality and liberty and embrace all of us because we were all created equal. We are all worthy of God's eyes. So I wish you all a happy Independence Day and Fourth of July. Please pray for those who feel marginalized in our own country. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. We're so grateful that you revealed yourself among us, that you have loved each of us as your children, each of us precious in your sight, each of us a reflection of you, each of us bound together by love as we remember on this day marking anniversaries and birthdays and new beginnings. We know that your love and all love is your presence among us. And we come to you, God, some of us carrying heavy burdens, knowing that some of us in this room and those that we care for bear the yoke of illness. We pray for our artist brother, for, for Diana's uncle and aunt, for Joy's friend, Claire. Some of us bear the yoke of loss and grief. We remember Diana's uncle this week. Some of us bear the yoke of caring for those who cannot care for themselves. Some of us bear the yoke of unemployment or underemployment. Some of us the yoke of hunger. Some of us the yoke of oppression or marginalization. Some of the yoke of violence. We remember Afghanistan. We remember the people, especially the most vulnerable people there. Some bear the yoke of anger. Some of us, the yoke of depression or addiction. And some in our country and around the world in the rubble of disaster. We remember the folks in Florida, the folks anywhere whose homes have crumbled. From these and from so many other yokes, dear God, we pray for rest. We pray for healing. We pray for release and we pray for wholeness. Gracious God, we thank you today for this land in which we live. We thank you for the multitude of opportunities, 
And we pray that you would forgive us for a lack of creativity in sharing our nation's boundless abundance, for our lack of creativity in sharing it equitably. Forgive us for tarnishing our political process with greed. Forgive us for failing the need. Save us, God, from the litany of destructive behaviors that Paul outlined when he spoke of strife and jealousy and anger, quarrels, dissension, factions, envy, and all that would undo us. Today, God, lead us instead to strive for the fruits of the Spirit. Help us to develop loving behaviors that demonstrate compassion. Help us in an over-serious and gloomy world to know real joy, because you have overcome the world. Help us to work for peace in a world that seems to prefer violence. Help us in our hurry-up world to develop patience, and to learn that all does not need to be completed in our hurry-up time. Help us to demonstrate kindness to all, and especially to those to whom we find it difficult to be kind. Help us to learn generosity with our resources, but help us especially to learn how to be generous in our attitudes and our behaviors toward people. God of all life, may peace and justice fill our land and indeed the whole world. We pray this morning for escalating tension and for places around the globe where people are victimized, where safety is threatened, where freedoms are denied, and where life is treated as anything less than sacred. Gracious God, grant us the yoke of Christ, binding us together, tethered by your love, guided by your presence, bringing your kingdom into this world. It's for this kingdom that we now pray using the words that Jesus taught us, saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Scripture reading today, uh, Psalm 48 and Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Psalm 48, the glory and the strength of Zion. Great is the Lord, and great to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion. In the far north, the city of the great king, with its citadels, God has shown himself to be a sure defense. Then the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded, they were in panic. They took to flight, trembling took hold of them there, pains as overwhelming in labor as when an east wind shatters the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so we have seen, in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God establishes forever. We ponder your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple, your name, O God, like your praise, reaches the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgment. Walk about Zion. Go all around it. Count its towers. 
of civil wellness ramparts, go through its citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide forever. And our New Testament reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they, the disciples, went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Thanks be to God for these messages to us in this day of and in this day of welcoming. You can stay seated for our next hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath.
pray with me, please. God, I pray for breath. I pray for your spirit to give life, to come in the space between us so that we go out from this place changed. Pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Two weeks ago, I was at an airport boarding gate for the first time in 18 months. 18 months since I had heard those constant airport announcements that fill the atmosphere that say, do not leave your baggage unattended. Smoking is not permitted. And then the one that the gate agents like to repeat several times, passengers are limited to one carry-on bag and one personal item. The carry-on bag must fit easily within our bag size or including wheels or handles. Bags that do not meet our requirements will be checked to your final destination aka limit your luggage. Don't be carrying around too many bags. So I'm standing there at this gate listening to that announcement over and over and in that red backpack of mine I have a tent, a sleeping bag, clothes and shoes, books and journals, toiletries, snacks, warm weather gear, cold weather gear, extra masks, extra snacks, my phone, my passport, that inflatable pillow, and a few more snacks. And a break. <laughs> yes. And I'm trying to get a head start on the sermon for this Sunday, so I pulled up the lectionary for, for this week on my phone. And I read the passage from Mark 6, and it was like Jesus and the Air Canada gate agents were conspiring to make me feel conspicuous with my overpacked red backpack. I'm sending you out, Jesus says, pack light. Limit your luggage. Don't be carrying around so much stuff. Jesus says, bring what you're wearing, one pair of sandals and a staff. No hidden money squirreled away somewhere, no change of clothes, nor just in case stash, and no snacks. What is with these instructions, do you think? Are they for us? What do they mean? I want us to look a little bit back at what's happening. What's happening with Jesus there in Mark 6? He's having kind of a rough go of it. He was doing pretty well on the miracle and the teaching and the healing fronts back in the earlier chapters. But now he's come to Nazareth, the place where he grew up. And you know how it ends when you go back to your hometown and every Everyone still sees you and treats you like the kid you once were. No matter where you've been, what you've managed to accomplish, no matter how much inner work you have done to grow and mature, you go home and all people can talk about is that same embarrassing story of how you sang the accidental solo in the Christmas pageant when you were eight. <laughs> it's hard sometimes. Sometimes close to impossible to be taken seriously as an adult by people who remember you as a child. If that's you, Jesus gets it. It's what's happening to him here. People are saying, isn't this Joseph's kid? Isn't that Mary's little boy? What's he doing all up here trying to school us? Jesus is trying to heal and teach just like he's been in other towns, but he's not getting at home. And so in verse 7, having done what he can, he moves on to some other villages. And his disciples, remember, his disciples have been following him this whole time. They followed him into Nazareth, they watched him struggle, and they followed him out. And Jesus uses this moment, this moment of not exactly a failure, but not really arousing success either. Jesus uses this moment at Nazareth as a sending moment. He has just modeled for them, and now it's their turn. Go out, he says, two by two to new places. Go stay with people in their houses. And if it doesn't work, keep going. Go and do what is needed which he says is to heal and anoint and call for repentance and softened hearts. 
Christ is sending out the disciples to make more disciples by building relationships. Here in Mark, we get a pretty clear picture of what Jesus expects. Life as a disciple looks a lot like Jesus' life, going from place to place, not carrying a lot of stuff, not necessarily appearing that successful, but prioritizing relationship above all, being with people as an end and not as a means to an end. That's the call. Even if we in this church aren't physically as nomadic as Jesus, the call is to be in motion, to be dynamic and not static, to always be seeking someone new to talk to. It's like we're on this lifelong camping trip where we set up camp and we share life and space. We show up and we stay in one another's lives, sometimes for a season, sometimes for longer, sometimes just for the length of one conversation had in passing, we pass. I'm sending you on a journey, Jesus says, and the objective of your journey is to meet people and love them. You don't need a lot of stuff. The only other time that I've preached this text, I think, was on my first Sunday ever as a pastor three miles down the road at Bethesda. What do you guys call it? Do you call it Other Bethesda or South Bethesda? <laughs> anyway, so it was July 7th, 2013, and I stood up and I preached about Jesus' words here, and I probably told a similar story about overpacking for another trip, because that's what I do. And then I sat down, and the service ended, and we set about the work of building relationship. I set about the work of loving, of making mistakes, and requiring much grace along the way. I remember that first Sunday, two young adults asked if I wanted to get lunch with them after church, and I was like, no, I packed my lunch, thanks. Oops. <laughs> Missed opportunity to start a relationship right there. So I learned. And then after five years at Bethesda, it was time to move, and I pitched camp with Glenmont UNC, where I've learned and made more mistakes, and hopefully you all will benefit from those mistakes and I can make brand new ones here. <laughs> and then the call came again this winter. And so I'm here and you and I were setting up camp together. And what I need to hear, and I'm gonna offer the words to you if you need to hear them too, what I need to hear are Christ's words to be fully present wherever you are. To come to a house, he says, and stay there. Now, sleeping over at someone's house as a traveler is a somewhat vulnerable thing to do. Remember the tale of Macbeth? And not only show up and stay with someone, but show up hungry. Come to a new relationship with space, with openness. One of you in the choir said, an open heart. Come to a new relationship with want. Christ says to his disciples, don't walk around all self-sufficient, thinking you plan for every circumstance and have your emergency cliff bars and you're going to stay at the hotel down the street with thanks for the offer. Or me, I packed a lunch, church people, so thanks for the offer, but no. No. If the call of the gospel is to build relationship, then we're going to have to show up hungry for it. If the work of the Spirit is in surprises, then we've got to quit trying to plan and prepare for every possible circumstance, right? One reason that we, I, overpack is because we're trying to guard against the unexpected. But God does some of God's best work in the unexpected. For example, I bring all these papers up here, right? I brought them, I stood over there with them, I packed them away, I carried them, so that I know what to say for a prayer. And there's not like awkward silence when I'm so nervous that my brain turns off. But what would happen if I left the papers in my office, and when my brain turns off, I say, hey, brothers and sisters, I need someone to come up here and pray. And Hilda, 
gets up here and prays. And we catch a glimpse of the spirit in her spirit, of the word in her words. And we find ourselves in the unexpected, just a bit closer to each other and to God. It can be intriguing and uncomfortable to move through the world without our supplies, without our script. Always pitching camp in new places, knowing that very little is permanent, but that one permanent thing is God's love shared between God's people. Jesus tells us to travel light as people who are part of a community rather than self-reliant. He tells us to arrive fully and vulnerably into new relationship, to not carry around a lot of baggage from where we came from. Shake that dust, he says. Don't carry your grudges around, your prejudice or your bitterness or your own self-judgment from a past failure. Shake the dust. There's always more to love. And so I hope to do that here. And I hope you'll do that with me. Pitch tent together. Meet the unexpected things that happen, both major and trivial, with openness and lightness and intrigue about what that spirit is up to. And as we do that here, as we set up camp together and show up fully and build relationship with each other, it will be good practice for what we're really doing. Because Christ isn't sitting here in Mark sending his disciples to go to church and be great church members. The destination for the disciples who are sent out in pairs to heal and anoint and love and learn, the destination isn't some beloved sanctuary or religious institution. The church is not a permanent landing place for us. It's a sending place. Even as you live and worship and love at North Bethesda, you are being sent by Jesus to do as he did in his daily life, to meet people, to share stories, to break bread, and to offer healing. You're being sent, like those disciples, to arrive in new places, open and willing to love. And so where is it, do you think, that you're being sent this week, this season. How will you travel? On foot? By phone? By prayer? What is essential to carry with you and what will you leave behind in faith that God will provide? We may be homebodies or even homebound, but as disciples, we are not stationary. We are being sent to meet new people, trusting that all those folks whose lives have coalesced with ours, whether because of a single conversation or decades of friendship, that all those people are held together in this fabric of God's love. We're travelers. We don't rely on our stuff. We don't rely on sameness or predictability or our false hope that we can prepare for everything. We travel light. We rely on the living God, the God that we know who is actively creating, whose character and enfleshed love we know in Jesus and who is always stirring things up in that fiery, and so like those disciples Jesus sent that first day, and all those he's been sending ever since, we strap on our sandals, we open our hearts, and we go for it. Thanks be to God. When we come to some places, like how today you and I are arriving at this new campground together, one of the things we do after we've unpacked our mostly unnecessary items, one of the best things we can do is to sit around the campfire and tell stories. Humans have been doing that since there were campfires, and it's how many of the stories of the Bible 
were first told, passed down, told from parents to children, grandparents on, generation to generation. And so for my first couple of months here, I'd like to focus on stories, on your stories, on our story in the Bible and how they come together. And so you'll see that mysterious post-it note somewhere on a pew where you're sitting. And I invite you to take that post-it note and hopefully something to write with that you see in the pew or have brought with you. I invite you to write your name on that, if you don't mind. And then a Bible story. Anything, any Bible story that's important to you, one that you come back to again and again. This is not a test. You don't need to do like chapter and verse. You can just do it like Friends episode style, like the one where the midwives of Egypt saved the baby boys. And when you're done, we're going to have an offertory who's going to help me set up an easel here with a blank, um, a blank board. And when you're done, I invite you, if you're comfortable, to come one at a time in a very distanced and responsible manner to place your post-it note on the board as well as any offering you have in the place. And if you're watching from home or if you're just more comfortable where you are, you can leave the post-it note in your pew or you can email it to me. My email address is right there on the screen. You can leave it in the comments if you're watching on Zoom. But I'm going to look at all of them because I want to know who you are. I want to know what stories are foundational here. And then I'm going to choose seven or eight of them maybe that are named the most times or that I think are super interesting to preach on. One a week for the rest of the summer. It's a starting place, a story. It's a starting place and a place from where we grow. And so I invite you to offer in the time that we have to offer that piece of yourself to me to get to know you and to your fellow church members so that we can start to share parts of who we are with each other. I invite you to offer that in faith when you are ready and as you are.
Closing him, 577, God of grace.
with the love and the provision of God, with the friendship of Christ who walks alongside you and sends you out, and with the Spirit who is always by your side. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. 